Welcome back to Occult Symbolism and Pop Culture. I'm your host, Isaac Wise. Up today, we're going to cover Wizard of Oz, Part 3, in conclusion, mega conclusion. That's right. So you've listened to, surely, Part 1 and Part 2 of my Wizard of Oz deep dive into the occult symbolism of this tale. Part 1, we talked about the inspiration behind it from L. Frank Baum, the cast and crew, their ups and downs and then in part two we walked through the whole movie and i touched on various topics various ideas various theories okay now it is time my friends to put a bow on this thing this is part three and we're going to zoom back out we're going to consider what is this tale all about it's about the evolution of consciousness and l frank Baum knew this L. Frank Baum embedded it in this beloved tale, inviting its viewers to go down their own yellow brick road. And today we're going to go through all the ideas that we previously touched upon, but we need to go a little deeper. We'll find out how the Book of Enoch ties into all this, because it turns out Oz could be a fallen angel. That's right. Uh we'll find out why this is about Dorothy finding her true will we'll find out why silver gold and emerald are all symbolic and we'll lightly touch on various interpretations and theories about this movie before getting into the real inspiration the real inspiration was theosophy Helena Blavatsky's belief system of ushering in a Luciferian New World Order. Hey, you know what? Her word's not mine. And there's a lot of occult, alchemical messaging embedded in this tale. And that's what we're doing right now. I advise you strongly listen to part one and two. Links are always going to be in the show notes. Because if you don't listen to part one and two, this might go a little too fast for you. All right? So part three, the in conclusion episode, because you know I like I like I like a nice long winded conclusion wrap up, and that's what you're getting today. So what's Wizard of Oz all about? Well, much like Alice in Wonderland, it's about opening up the minds of the youth to accept this occult fantasy of reality. It's the evolution of consciousness. They are slowly indoctrinating the masses with these ideas over a time span of 10, 20, 100, 500 years. It's the spiral, just like how the Yellow Brick Road starts out as a spiral. That's what this is. It's not a light switch. It's an indoctrination, massaging of the subconscious, if you will. And, you know, we all end up going down the yellow brick road. And and how far you end up going down is subjective. It's going to be up to you. And all that spiral symbolism from this tale suggests it is the evolution of consciousness. The tornado is, of course, a spiral. The yellow brick road starts out as a spiral. These are Helena Blavatsky's ideas that L. Frank Baum is trying to evolve us to understand. And Aleister Crowley, you can lump that in with Helena Blavatsky, said every man and every woman is a star. And this is kind of what Blavatsky was saying. Blavatsky says, look, for ev- for this, this spirit you have, this divine spark from the real God that is trapped in the human body, trapped on this prison planet. There's a higher self out there, out in the stars, out in the cosmos, the astral self. And the way one can get in touch with this is through the silver cord, which is why Dorothy's shoes were silver in the book. And that's why... At the end of the film, the good witch, she came down in a bubble, Doug. 
grow up. She came down <laughs> and she had the pentagram. She had the star on the wand. And that was when Dorothy realized the path to salvation for her back to home, back to Kansas, was always under her power. It was her decision. There, and like I said at the beginning of part one, there were several... Re- I went through so many resources on Wizard of Oz. So many videos, so many podcasts. There's a lot out there. And in fact, there's even more. I don't have time to keep doing this. I could probably devote a whole year to talking about Wizard of Oz, honestly. Uh, yeah, Maybe I should write a book someday. I've got, hell, i got 30 pages of notes already, which is about 100 pages of book. Just got to find the time to do it. And one of these was a like a three or four hour video by the Dark Journalist. And in that episode, he quoted out L. Frank Baum from the Aberdeen Saturday Pioneer, February 22nd, 1890. The quote is, The appetite of our age for occultism demands to be satisfied. And while with the mediocrity of people will result in mere sensationalism, it will lead in many to higher and nobler and bolder thought. And who can tell what mysteries these braver and abler intellects may unravel in future ages? So you can see, he's not trying to convert everybody in 1939. Well, he's dead. I think he's dead at that point. In 1905, when he wrote the book, he's talking about intellects in the future. They got to they gotta get the ball rolling, right? And to be fair to these occultists, I don't think that they think that this is evil or nefarious. They believe that Lucifer is the liberator from the false god. Now, because of our religious society, they can't come out and say, Hey everybody, we worship Lucifer and it turns out Lucifer is trying to tell us the truth and give us wisdom because the God you worship is a false God. You can see why they can't just come out and say that, right? The backlash would be too much. So they have to plant these seeds. They have to plant these stories and these themes into the minds. And just like if you've ever read Fast Food Nation, which is about the evils of fast food, Corporate America at its finest. They talk about how the cereals and the fast food, they target ads towards children because they know they can hook them young and then they have a lifelong customer. Plus, a child's mind is growing and absorbing all this information like a sponge to inform its own worldview. So that's what's happening here. And... What the occult practice in particular of what's going on with Dorothy is she is trying to find her true self, her true will, her higher self. Like Blavatsky would say, the astral self. And this is done in the form of the holy guardian angel. Everybody had one. Aleister Crowley's got one named Awaz, who he later identified as Lucifer. And Dion Fortune wrote a book called Mystical Kabbalah, and she says this, quote, Those who are familiar with Kabbalistic terminology know that the first of the greater initiations is said to consist of the power to enjoy the knowledge and conversation of our holy guardian angel. This holy guardian angel, be it remembered, is really our own higher self. It is the prime characteristic of this higher mode of mentation that it consists neither in voices nor visions, but it is pure consciousness. It is an intensification of awareness. And from this quickening of the mind comes a peculiar power of insight and penetration which is of the nature of hyper-developed intuition. Now, you can see why when you read some of these occult books, they're very difficult to wrap your mind around. A lot of heavy-duty million-dollar words there. That's why several of these books, particularly uh, Blavatsky and Dion Fortune and a lot of Crowley's work, it, I try reading them, but it's very difficult for me to try to understand it cover to cover, or Manly P. Hall. 
Because there's a lot of coded language in there. And it's meant so that initiates who know what they're looking for understand it. And that's what we try to do in this podcast is try to understand it. There's probably people out there who are very well uh, informed about these subjects. And maybe they listen to some episodes and say, wow, Isaac, you got it way wrong. (laughs) Very possible. I don't know. I'm not an initiate. I'm just reading, trying to make sense. So anyway, each character in Wizard of Oz, they need something, right? Dorothy needs to go home. Tin Man needs a heart. And so on. But it's revealed at the end that they had it the whole time. They just had to get in touch with their holy guardian angel, their higher self, their astral body. So these characters, they ascend spiritually. And that's where we get this talk about good witches and bad witches and how they're tied to the cardinal directions of north, south, east, and west. All right. And if you listen to Blood So Said So, they did an episode on Wizard of Oz, which ironically was the inspiration for me to start researching Wizard of Oz. I listened to that episode maybe a year ago. I was like, oh, this is really good. And then I started digging into it, and the hole kept expanding as I went down. But Bledsoe said so, did a great episode on this. And the idea is that east and west, left and right, these are the material realms. This is the material plane, the horizontal plane, okay? And that's considered evil. The material world is considered evil to the Gnostics. Then you got north and south. And this is considered the good witches. You know? The good witches from north and south, evil witches from east and west. So you what so what's up with the vertical, right? The north and south. Well, it's the spiritual plane to ascend and descend in consciousness. And cardinal directions are important in very different rituals, different occult practices. Like in the Church of Satan, they conduct psychodramas and the practitioners call upon the cardinal directions during the incantations. In ritualistic Kabbalah, they conduct what's called a supreme invoking ritual of the pentagram. They utilize different corners of the pentagram, the star, like the uh, you know the symbol of water would be the inverted triangle portion of a pentagram, in order to keep unwanted intruders away or whatever. In Wicca, the inverted triangle of water represents the cardinal direction of west. And the direction of north is the symbol for earth. Um, anyway, and so on. In paganism, the, the equinoxes are the east and west, and the solstices are north and south, following the sun's location, and so on, right? And this is where you could dip into astrology, where they they show how the cross of spirit and matter is actually the zodiac, right? Because the circle is the symbol of the spirit represented as infinity, the Ouroboros, no beginning and no end, which is on, if you, look, I don't know if you follow me on the socials. I posted on Instagram, Damar Hamlin, the sports ball guy who, who was died and brought back to life or whatever happened there. At the Super Bowl, he was wearing a jacket with what looks like a cartoon zombie Christ on a cross. And I posted on my Instagram, turns out that design was from a particular artist. And that design was created for Travis Scott, depicting Travis Scott as Christ. It's called the Travis Christ artwork. Not surprised. I've covered a lot of Travis Scott over the years. You want to talk Illuminate Confirm, that's Illuminate Confirm. So check that out on the Instagram if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, what are we talking about? Oh, yeah, but anyways, on that DeMar Hamlin jacket, it does say something about no beginning, no end, right? It's the Kabbalistic spark. Energy never dies. The Black Eyed Peas say this, right? But anyways, you got the circle, which is the spirit, and the cross, which is the matter, the three-dimensional world, the physical body that the spark gets put into. Some would say that the cross is actually an unfolded cube, if you look at it from that perspective. 
And in terms of the occult, if you refer to Robert Sullivan, his book, Cinema Symbolism, I had him on the show a couple times. He talks about the two axes of the the north-south axis as the ladder of Minerva or Mithras, and the Freemasons call it the winding stairs. But it's the same concept for all this. It's about leaving the material realm of the east and west plane, that's the evil witches, and reaching, ascending through the sacred dimensions, through spiritual progress, trying to ascend your consciousness north or, you know, or south. And through Dorothy's selflessness and journeys, she traverses the Kabbalistic tree of life in the, in the uh, yellow brick road. She can achieve spiritual gnosis. Now to bring it, cause I know we're getting deep here, bring it back to the sort of regular world. BBC.com has a nice little article, a summation of different possible interpretations of the tale. One is the gold standard. That's one of the popular ones. And the idea was that William McKinley was president when the book was written. And he was part of this argument to keep America on the gold standard. And then McKinley got blasted, right? He is the character of Oz. And the Yellow Brick Road is the gold standard. That leads to the Emerald City, which the Emerald City is the American green dollars, the greenbacks. And Dorothy's silver shoes are supposed to be the silver standard. And the roads, all roads lead to the green paper dollars. And Oz, of course, is the abbreviation for ounce. You know, OZ is ounce, which you measure the precious metals in on the gold and silver standard. So that's one idea. Another one, there's a religious angle. They say, I'm going to read you from BBC's website. It says, while Henry Littlefield was keen to dismiss any comparisons with the Pilgrim's Progress, church pastors would beg to differ. Christian sermons have discussed the Wizard of Oz biblical meanings comparing Dorothy's song Over the Rainbow to the tale of Noah from the book of Genesis or claiming that the Emerald City represents the heavenly city, the New Jerusalem. One minister in a Florida megachurch developed a month-long series of Wizard of Oz-themed homilies featuring a musical performance of Kanye West's single Heartless by a Tin Man. I don't know how that can, I don't know how Kanye West's, I mean, obviously the song is about not having a heart. Tin Man wouldn't have a heart. Uh, That sounds actually kind of interesting. While some praise the Wizard of Oz for its spiritual insight, others have criticized it for moral turpitude. From the moment Baum's book was published in 1900, ministers attacked it for its ungodly influence. In 1986, seven fundamentalist Christian families in Tennessee filed a lawsuit against the novel's inclusion in the public school syllabus, arguing that it promotes the belief that human attributes are individually developed rather than God-given. Again, it's about looking... And and look, I don't know the answer here, folks. But I do know the story is about Dorothy and the characters making contact with their holy guardian angel or pursuing their astral self or whatever, finding the solution internally doing their will versus god's will that's the idea here now how how much do you want to split hairs and and burn books Uh, whatever it's up to you i actually enjoy the wizard of oz story i i've contemplated reading the books there's like 20 of them but my whole thing is always just be aware of these ideas So the group claimed that it's theologically impossible for a good witch to exist, (laughs) with one parent saying, I do not want my children seduced into godless supernaturalism. Southern Baptist Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson attempted to ban the film's broadcast on TV in 2004. Robertson claimed, The Almighty told me that flying monkeys and witches are an affront to all good Christians. Now when they say stuff like that with no basis to to back it up... Like people, this just looks crazy, right? 
they look like the nutty Christians. Which is why, I, I don't know, I prefer to do a little deep dive. Let's understand what's going on here. I'm not calling for nothing to get banned. And Jerry Falwell, by the way, wasn't he cucking? Wasn't he having his, wasn't he paying the uh, pool boy to stoop his wife? Remember that? Or was that his son? I don't know. Whatever. To each his own. You know, sometimes, sometimes when a man loves a woman, that man finds another man and, you know, things get messy. (laughs) But anyway, the point is, the larger story, what I think, like those are just a couple theories about it. I think that L. Frank Baum, being a theosophist, is clearly embedding theosophical ideas into the story. Uh, Frank Baum and his wife, Maude Gage, joined the Theosophical Society in Pasadena. Now, Pasadena is where Jack Parsons was doing all kinds of dirt back in uh, when he was around. And fun fact, the first book that Sirhan Sirhan asked for in prison was... Helena Blavatsky's The Secret Doctrine about Theosophy. And Sirhan Sirhan, of course, famous for, uh, what did he do? Assassinated Robert F. Kennedy, I think. But he was an MK Ultra victim, I believe. No, all that's just coming into my brain, sorry. And there's claims that Elvis was into Theosophy. I had someone on Patreon saying that that maybe wasn't true entirely. I don't know, I gotta dig into that. Uh, I like Elvis, fair enough. I'm just not a huge Elvis fan, so I don't know his whole story. But I do recall people saying that he walked around with Lena Blavatsky's books. And that's what the cape was all about. He tried to show himself as an ascended master with the big, uh, what do you call it? You know, the cape thing. You know what I'm talking about. With the big frilly necks. So the idea is that Dorothy, she's living in the black and white world of the Gnostic Demiurge, the prison planet of Kansas. The tornado comes, the spiral evolves her consciousness, takes her over the rainbow to a fantastical world. This is the Gnostic tale. The Gnostic tale is that the black and white Kansas is the prison planet, which they say we are on right now. I don't know. I'm looking out. I'm looking out my window. I see the sun shining. I see beautiful mountains and and wonderful snow. I hate snow, but, you know, we need it. Doesn't look like a prison to me. It's a pretty damn good prison if that's what it is. But the the Gnostic thinks this is a prison and we can somehow ascend and break free from this false god and enter into where the real god came from, where this Kabbalistic spark came from, in the Pleroma, they call it. And that's the land of Oz. If you... Oh, boy, I don't know how deep you guys want to go on this. Robert Sullivan's got more on this. I'm going to read to you until it seems like maybe we're getting too deep. Robert Sullivan's book says, The powerful cyclone is the winding stairs of the mysteries, the ladder of Mithras, or Minerva, that commences initiation to receive receive sublime wisdom. Apotheosis, which means man becoming God. Mirroring the winding stairs leading to the middle chamber of a Masonic fellow craft degree, where the candidate is instructed to study the seven liberal arts and sciences. Now, Robert Sullivan should know he's a 32 or 33 degree Freemasonry. I think he's a 32. Could be wrong on that. The winding stairs of the fellow craft degree symbolizes the gnosis of the candidate and his maturation as an independent thinker. This section of the degree draws on the symbolism of the early system of Jewish mystical thought, Kabbalah, and on the symbols of alchemy. The alchemists were philosophers who believed that the physical world could reveal spiritual and esoteric truths. Thus, a winding staircase is correctly identified as a symbol of Masonic ascension in 2004's National Treasure. The the cyclone elevates Dorothy to Oz, the Gnostic ascension, and that's exactly what I was talking about, right? Into the Pleroma. Paralleling Alice's adventures in Wonderland, where Alice ventures to a mystical world by way of a winding staircase symbolized by a cylindrical rabbit hole. All right. So there you go. A guy who's much more educated on these matters than I breaks it down to. He sees the same thing. Now, 
that same BBC article I read about the gold standard and those ideas, they actually mentioned the theosophical angle. And this is what they say. Theosophists seek to understand the mysteries of the universe, finding the common roots of all religions to uncover a secret universal doctrine. In 1890, Baum wrote a series of articles praising the quasi-religious movement, and in 1892 he joined the Theosophical Society. According to an occult reading of the Wizard of Oz, the Yellow Brick Road is viewed as the golden path in Buddhism, along which the soul travels to illumination. Illumination confirmed. The cyclone represents the theosophical belief in reincarnation as a soul goes through a cycle of physical births and deaths before it becomes divine. Blah, blah, blah. Dorothy's silver shoes are seen as Baum's version of a silver cord that connects our physical bodies with our astral bodies, and the wizard symbolizes the god figure of organized religion. Again, the false god of Gnosticism. Oh, boy. Yeah, it kind of keeps going on. We're going to skip the rest of that because we kind of covered all these ideas. Now, alchemy. Uh, Robert Sullivan mentioned alchemy, and that's part of the storyline, too, because Dorothy goes from wearing silver slippers in the book to the golden road. She changes base metals in a way. You know, typically they, sh they demonstrate it as going from lead to gold. This one is silver to gold. And Sullivan's book talks about how silver represents the moon and Dorothy's feminine energy. And they say that witches favor silver amulets to enhance their psychic and magical powers. So fellas out there, if you're buying your wife some silver jewelry, be careful she doesn't have that witch blood. She's going to know what you're doing. She's going to see right through all your little lies. You're saying you're taking the trash out and you're playing video games or whatever you're doing. You got to be careful. These women are very intuitive. Uh, was it? F uh, boy. Um, we talked about this on the last episode, I think. Was it Rudolf Steiner who said women came from Atlantis and they have a stronger uh, intuition than men? Sometimes it's the truth. All right. Now, Emerald City symbolism. Let's talk about that. Because Emerald, of course, associates us with the Emerald Tablets of Thoth. And this is the whole story of alchemy. Thoth, a.k.a. Hermes Trismegistus, this Egyptian alien god, came down, taught man these forbidden secrets, which is very much the uh, story of the Watchers and the Fallen Angels of the Bible and the Book of Enoch, which we're going to cover here in a bit. And the, these these men inscribed, or maybe it was Hermes inscribed onto emerald tablets. I think it was the men that did it, though. And these emerald tablets got stored in the Library of Alexandria and whatever. Got pilfered. Yada, yada, yada. But the whole story is about Dorothy receiving the wisdom that is encoded on the emerald tablets. The wisdom of Thoth. All right. And the guard at the Emerald, uh, at the Land of Oz, the Emerald City, the guard is called the Green Man. He calls himself the Guardian of the Gates. Now, the Green Man is important because this symbolizes life, death, and rebirth. There it is again. The idea of how we die and we have to learn these lessons and come back and relive life and keep learning until we ascend into the Pleroma. And Osiris is known as the green man. He is depicted in nature scenes. He's depicted as the horned god sometimes or pan. And this ties into some of the more esoteric symbolism of the horns, the devil horns, the mano cornudo. The horns are symbolic of enlightenment into these occult practices. They sometimes show Moses with horns, if you've ever seen that, which uh, apparently represented power. But these twin horns are a reference to the brow chakra, a.k.a. the pineal gland. So sometimes these horn symbols, they refer to, you know, Moloch is what we usually say. But it also represents the enlightenment of the third eye. And the guardian is an interesting uh, job title for the green man. Because the guardian is what Crowley calls 
Caronzone who guards the abyss. This demonic guardian of Dayoth, where the initiates go for their night of pan ritual for annihilation of the ego. And the Buddhists call this process falling into the abyss. Which ties us into Stranger Things, right? Shows us the upside down and the, the Demogorgon who guards it. The Demogorgon is the Corona Zone, is the guardian. And some say these guardians, they're, they're, the whole purpose of the guardian, of the Corona Zone or whatever you want to call it, is to block the path to personal transformation. It blocks one from understanding of self and summoning their holy guardian angel, astral body Silver cord linkage. <laughs> I know some of you are probably like, bro, you're on some next level crazy talk right now. Just stick with me, all right? Stick with me. Maybe listen to this episode twice. And I'm not going to pretend to understand this stuff crystal clear. I kind of get what they're trying to get at here. How it works in real life, beyond me. I don't know. As As Ice Cube say, I'm scared and I go to church, all right? Now, Gnosticism, we mentioned this a few times. And the basic idea of Gnosticism, they believe that the creator of our world, the God we worship, the Abrahamic God of the, the Christian, the Muslims, and all, is actually a false god. A group of archons called the Demiurge. And this leader is called the Yaldabaoth, depicted as a lion-faced serpent. And the real god out in the Pleroma is the supreme being that we need to try to make contact with. So the Abrahamic religions, according to the Gnostics, worship the false god, the Yaldabaoth. And the Yaldabaoth is Oz in the story. But what does Oz look like? I mean, we see it in the film, but what about the book? Well, I looked it up for you, and it says... I'm going to read you from the book. Uh, bah, bah, bah. They try to ask what Oz looks like, and the, and the guy says, that's hard to tell. You see, Oz is a great wizard and can take on any form he wishes. So that some say he looks like a bird, some say he looks like an elephant, some say he looks like a cat. To others, he appears as a beautiful fairy or a brownie, ooh, or in any other form that pleases him. But who the real Oz is when he is in his own form, no living person can tell. So Oz present in the book, Oz presents himself in his various forms to the different characters. To Dorothy, he appears like the big head that you see in the film. To Scarecrow, he looks like a woman with wings. To the Tin Man, he is a beast. To the Lion, he is a ball of fire. So he can change his depiction. And just like the Yaldabaoth, Oz is he's the mean old god. He's the jealous Old Testament god who demands we worship him. Which, to me, from my very minimal knowledge of the Bible, is uh, that seems like a false idea that non-Christians want to perpetuate. God gave us free will. He doesn't... I mean, I get it, right? Like, George Carlin has a really good bit that talks about this. Because he's, <laughs> he's like, hey, I'm God, and you better do this, and you better do that, and you better worship me. And if you don't, you're going to hell. And by the way, I love you. You know, which is, I get it. That's kind of funny. But, you know, God gave us free will. And he does tell us if we do the wrong stuff, <laughs> you go to hell for eternity. But, you know, Christ came and got us off the hook. In a way, right? You just got to ask forgiveness. You got to ask forgiveness to God. Believe in God. So when the crew... When the Oz crew, they get to the gate guard, the Corona Zone character. This is what it says in the book. It has been many years since anyone asked me to see Oz. He is powerful and terrible. And if you come on an idle or foolish errand to bother the wise reflections of the great wizard, he might be angry and destroy you all in an instant. Sounds like a real jerk. Sounds like the Old Testament God that people want to perpetuate. And also there's a messaging that followers of Oz, followers of Christ, are blind. They're manipulated. Because in the book, when Dorothy gets to the gate, the, the green man says, I am the guardian of the gates, and since you demand to see the great Oz, I must take you to his palace. 
But first you must put on the spectacles. Why? asked Dorothy. Because if you did not wear spectacles, the brightness and glory of the Emerald City would blind you. Even those who live in the city must wear spectacles night and day. They are locked on. For Oz so ordered it when the city was first built, and I have the only key that will unlock them. So they're saying God closed the eyes, lied to these people, and tricked them. Because he's a shyster in the tale, right? Um, and then, you know, the book goes on to talk about how they put the glasses on with these golden bands and so on. And when the crew, they finally get in there to see Oz, they're told they have to go in one at a time. And, and this is very much, uh, this is where manipulation can happen when you go in one at a time. It's like when the cops arrest some people. They don't ever interview them when they're in the room together. They interview them one at a time. More easy, easier to control the situation, you know? So the guard, they're going in to see Oz, and the guard talks to Dorothy, and he says, uh, bah, bah, bah. Then he asked me what you looked like, and when I mentioned your silver, silver shoes, he was very much interested. At last, I told him about the mark upon your forehead, and he decided he would admit you to his presence. That's right. If you, It's not in the movie. It's in the book. There's this whole plot line about how Dorothy has the mark on her forehead, the mark of the beast. And it's actually a kiss from the good witch, but I find it very interesting to call it the mark upon her forehead. And if you recall in the movie, I put the images on the, my movie analysis post on Instagram. Do you remember when... The Tin Man and Dorothy and Scarecrow and the Lion, they get to Oz, the, the land of Oz, and they send them to the to get washed up and cleaned up or whatever, pampered, the spa. And there were these X's all over the rooms. It said like Super X, XX, and the big had a big wheel of X, which made no sense. It's not in the book. There's no relevance in the movie for why that happened. Well... The mark of the beast is known as the X inside the O, which is what you see with the Tin Man in the movie. He's got the X inside the O. That's the only thing I could connect this to. And you, to understand what this is about, you have to read from Kenneth Grant, his book called Aleister Crowley and the Hidden God. And, uh, you know, the great Freeman Fly talked about this years and years ago when I was first learning this stuff. And it talks about how Nodens, this lightning war god, and how he flashed forth as lightning from the depths and formed a throne in the celestial realm, a seat of stone where the goddess was established. And it talks about how the heart of Nodens' sigil is the same as that of the mark of the beast. And the mark of the beast is a fusion of X and O, which produces that lightning flash. And it's believed that the initiates... Um, would summon Nodens, the lightning from the depths, to establish contact with the goddess because of the union of the X and the O is sex magic. It's the union of the phallus with the vagina. So there you go. <laughs> the X and the O is the mark of the beast. Oh boy. Also, later in the book... After they destroy the Wicked Witch and they go back to the Emerald City, they're waiting and waiting for Oz to let them back to back in because they, they finally beat the witch. And they're like, okay, cool. Give us our stuff, Oz. And it says, they had no word from him the next day, nor the next, nor the next. The waiting was tiresome and wearing. And at last, they grew vexed that Oz should treat them in such a poor fashion after sending them to undergo hardships and slavery which sounds like the, the uh, wandering Jews of Egypt, slaves for the pharaohs wandering the desert. Now, what's interesting that uh, John over on Patreon commented on my episode one, I believe, part one of the Wizard of Oz deep dive, about how he found in his studies that Oz is actually an alternate spelling of A-Z, a as, I guess, Oz, Oz, A-Z, as in Azazel, A Z A Z E L, right? E L, of course, meaning Elohim, which means the gods. 
So John says that Azazel is um, the one who is in the desert of Dudael, which I had to look up, and it means the cauldron of God and the place of imprisonment of the fallen angels. And this is where you send the sun-covered goat, the black goat, and elsewhere the innocent and purest goat without blemish is sacrificed and its blood is sprinkled on the congregation. So is it true? Is Oz, O-Z, the same as Azazel? Well, on Wikipedia, it says this. It says, in the Bible, the name Azazel appears in association with the scapegoat rite, which is what John was saying with the black goat. The name represents a desolate place where a scapegoat bearing the sins of the Jews during Yom Kippur was sent. During the end of the Second Temple period, his association as a fallen angel responsible for introducing humans to forbidden knowledge emerged due to Hellenization, Christian narrative, and interpretation exemplified in the Book of Enoch. His role as a fallen angel remains in Christian and Islamic traditions. What are we, what are we saying here? Azazel, a fallen angel from the Book of Enoch, is one of the watchers. And I've got a bunch of notes. We're going to do a Book of Enoch show one of these days. I just got to finish it up. But we find out by the end of this story that Oz is, in fact, a fallen angel, the false god. Illuminate confirm, I think, maybe. And let's keep going with it, right? So they, the, 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 in the book, the characters that go to meet Oz for the second time. And he says, I am Oz, the great and terrible. Why do you seek me? They looked again in every part of the room, and then seeing no one, Dorothy asked, Where are you? I am everywhere, answered the voice, but to the eyes of common mortals, I am invisible. I will now seat myself upon my throne, that you may converse with me. So, again, it's just about deception of the false god. And... He reveals how, well, at this point in the book, Oz talks to them and he reveals how he was just a common man who was on a balloon, a Chinese surveillance balloon maybe, that ended up taking him to where he's at now, this place that he created called the Emerald City. And he talks about how he put glasses on everybody to manipulate them. Because in the book, every time they go to Emerald City, they got to wear the glasses, right? Because it's so bright. He says... Just to amuse myself and keep the good people busy, I ordered them to build this city and my palace, and they did it all willingly and well. Then I thought, as the country was so green and beautiful, I would call it the Emerald City. And to make the name fit better, I put green spectacles on all the people, and that everyone they saw, everything they saw was green. But isn't everything here green? asked Dorothy. No, more than in any other city. Oh, sorry. <laughs> So I don't narrate books too much. No more than in any other city, replied Oz. But when you wear green spectacles, why, of course, everything you see looks green to you. Which is very telling. And we should take some of this to heart as truthers, right? Sometimes we're looking for stuff, looking too hard. Maybe we're wrong. Sometimes. Uh, the Emerald City was built a great many years ago, for I was a young man when the balloon brought me here, and I'm a very old man now, but my people have worn green glasses on their eyes so long that most of them think it really is an Emerald City, and it certainly is a beautiful place, abounding in jewels and precious metals and every good thing that is needed to make one happy. <sighs> and look, I mean, and then that just supports more of the ideas of this false god creating this uh, prison planet. And the idea that it's, uh, everything here is a distraction. That's what they think. And the only way to get out of this prison, out of wearing the emerald glasses, is wisdom, the gnosis. And the Gnostics believe in wisdom over the false god. Wisdom is the only way out, the only way to ascend, like the good witches. And here's some examples from the book. The scarecrow asked, can't you give me brains? You don't need them. You are learning something every day. A baby has brains, but it doesn't know much. Experience is the only thing that brings knowledge, and the longer you are on earth, the more experience you are sure to get. 
So he bestowed, Oz bestows the wisdom upon the scarecrow. The lion says, but what about my courage? And he says, you have plenty of courage, I am sure. All you need is confidence in yourself. There is no living thing that is not afraid when it faces danger. The true courage is facing danger when you're afraid, and that kind of courage you have in plenty. And so on with the heart and all that, right? But now, recall back to when we did part two where we talked about the movie. Professor Marvel, he was the one the uh, crystal ball reader that told Dorothy about the Assyrian mysteries. And he's actually Oz in the movie, not so coincidentally. Uh, but this is, this is again, the mystery Babylon teachings where Osiris and Isis, not necessarily real people. They are symbols of the great work. And the great work is the perfection of self to become deified as a God. Apotheosis, as Robert Sullivan says. And of course, this all goes back to Plutarch, the Osiris and Isis dramas of Egyptian psychodrama plays and all that. And Plutarch said that Isis stands for knowledge. This is the wisdom, okay? And this is what Dorothy's all about. Let's wrap this up. In conclusion to the in conclusion. Dorothy, she lives in fear. She's in fear of dying and when when she's in the cyclone right and she goes into an altered state and she proclaims she wakes up she proclaims we must be over the rainbow and this is like an eyes wide shut they reference the rainbow many times that dr bill wants to know where the rainbow ends and it's through the death and rebirth ritual dorothy faces death in the cyclone and she awakens over the rainbow this is her hero's journey she goes underground i mean that's the idea she faces death and goes underground and this is where the initiation happens and by the end of the story everyone's getting their brains and their heart tchotchkes and all this right and oz had to think about how to answer dorothy's wish dorothy's like i want to go home and in the book this is referred to as crossing the desert. And of course, if you've been on my my podcast or website long enough, you know the desert is symbolic for occult initiation. It's an initiatory place. Historically, the desert is a place of pilgrimage for people seeking answers or spiritual experiences. In Paulo Coelho's book, the alchemist, he says, the desert is the greatest teacher. Paul Coelho, of course, a, f- a guy who followed Aleister Crowley in his early days. And, of course, Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, always rambling on and on about how great the alchemist is. Coded language, maybe. And the Charles Manson took his family out to the desert and taught them occult principles. Just like Santiago from The Alchemist. This is where uh, they did all the nuclear tests. This is where the Babylon working rituals happened. And, um, you know, Marjorie Cameron, we did a three-part deep dive on her years ago. Her and artist Bert Schoenberg, I believe I called him Big Bert, (laughs) uh, they studied George Jurdiff, who was an occultist who was teaching enlightenment through what he called the fourth way. He was also chummy with Crowley. Well, they went to the desert as well. And didn't he build a big UFO or something out there? In New Mexico, all kinds of symbolism out there with, with UFOs and underground military bases and Zorro Ranch. And that ties us into Kubrick's Lolita film and Roswell and blah, 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 blah. Right? A lot going on out there. But in the book, or in the story, I should say, Oz ends up, no, yeah, in the book, Oz ends up building a balloon to escape Emerald City. Dorothy's supposed to go, but she couldn't find Toto, so she stays there in Oz. And she tries to find the Good Witch of the South, Glinda. But um, Glinda tells Dorothy, look, your silver shoes will carry you over the desert. And you've always had the power to go home. And then the three the th- fellows are like, yeah, but if she would have gone back home, then we wouldn't have gotten our, all of our goods. 
So she had a destin- destiny, it was fate for her to help others find their true will, and then she found hers. Crowley, of, Alistair Crowley, of course, came up with this term, true will. It's his term. The idea that uh, uh, deterministic in philosophy, they call that determinism, that we each have our destiny and we have to figure out what it is so that we can pursue it at all costs. That's what Crowley's do what thou wilt means. Doesn't mean, hey, I want to go, uh, you know, have sex with strangers or whatever. That's not what it means. It means you find your true purpose, your fate for being in this world and pursue it at all cost. And maybe you, you're delusional and you think, well, you know, I'm supposed to do this, so therefore I will do this, that, and the other to get there. Again, it's it's a it's a nuanced thing, right? It's the, it's the difference, and I can only tell you from a Christian perspective, if I went into my priest and said, you know what, I'm just going to do what I think is right. I don't want to do prayer and fasting and going to church. I don't want to do those things, which is kind of true. I don't like doing some of that stuff. But I say, look, I don't think that's the right path for me to find God. I'm going to figure it out on my own. Thank you very much. That's me using my own will. And he would say, no, you need to give that up and follow God's will. And the Bible and the liturgy is the best way we know how to follow God's will. And that's the key difference. Uh, Satanism, left-hand path, is all about satisfying the self, whereas Christianity and some of the right-hand path religions are about doing what God has in store for you. Uh, yeah, wasn't there a, there's a Bible story, as a Job, he took all his, <laughs> God took all his stuff, and he, and he was like, all right, cool. I guess that's my, I guess that's what God's will is, I guess that's what I do. It's kind of like that. You got to have faith like at that level, I guess. So anyways, Dorothy, she finds her true will. Her consciousness ascends and descends. She comes back to the normal world, Kansas, to the Dust Bowl, having understood her true will and her purpose. And the wisdom she received in the process was to question authority and find the answers within oneself. And that's, uh, again, not to be dramatic, but the worship of self is by definition satanic. She's not doing the will of a higher power. She's doing her own will. And that's the key difference. That's the fundamental difference. So in conclusion, in conclusion, in conclusion, is the Wizard of Oz story illuminate confirmed? I'm sorry, but it is. If you look at it from all that perspective, from the last four or five hours we've been talking about this, it seems that it is. Now, does that mean you can't watch it? You shouldn't watch it? You shouldn't show your kids that stuff? I don't know about that. I mean, I, you know, I'm not one of these insane old Christians who's burning books and stuff. Just know that that's what goes on there. Explain it to your kids. I don't know. Or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm, I'm foolish for not wanting to condemn some of this entertainment. I could be steering you wrong. Don't listen to me. I'm just pointing out these ideas. So thank you for joining me. If you made it this far on the Wizard of Oz Deep Dive, thank you very much. I appreciate you letting me talk your ear off about this stuff. It's very interesting to me. And I'm happy that I've got an audience that likes to to, to hear out these ideas and, you know, take it home with you. See what you think. See if it fits. And, if you, and again, if you like the show, what I need is a five-star review. I got haters, and the haters mess me up on the algorithm. So if you want to help out, it's free. Drop yourself a nice little five-star review. And that'll help out the show immensely. And uh, I've got links in the show notes for all the things and all the places. You know what's up. Till next time, stay woke. Stay woke.